So you touched on this in an earlier decode, but I thought it was worth exploring it again, Nando. So, um, so with the general election coming up, rapidly approaching, the question is always about who eligible voters are going to vote for. We've seen countless segments in cable news about it. We see countless articles in publications like 538. We've got to look at the polling. We've got to look at the data. Oh, how is Trump doing in swing states? How's Biden doing in swing states? And all of that data, to be fair, is important. But it does tend to leave out the largest voting block. And the largest voting block consists of non-voters, people who are eligible to vote, but year after year or election after election, I should say, refuse to cast a ballot. And so just how large is this voting block? Well, let's take a look. And back in 2016, it's a pattern that we saw there, too. For example, 100 million people who were eligible to vote simply chose not to cast their ballot for either candidate. That's about 41 percent of people who could have voted. And so we're seeing that play out in McDowell County, West Virginia. And as you mentioned, Hallie, this is a county with the lowest voter turnout in the county and in the contiguous United States. So we asked people there why they chose not to vote in 2016 and if 2020 would be any different, especially given that more than 63% of that county chose not to vote in 2016. That's about 11,000 people. Mm, well, spoiler alert, uh, their feelings aren't any different, and we'll get back to them in just a second. But let's uh, dip into some historical numbers to see what Americans have, what the trends are when it comes to this block of non-voters. Well, since the 1960s, according to the New York Times, between a third and a half of eligible voters have stayed home during presidential elections, resulting in one of the lowest rates of voter turnout among America's developed peers. Since the early 1900s, the high point for presidential turnout was in 1960, when 63.8% of eligible voters or adults voted. Most recently, the highest peak was in 2008, when 61.6% .6 turned out. And of course, we all remember that election. That was when Obama ran against John McCain. And of course, Obama relied on this message of hope and change. He presented himself as this progressive, someone who really wanted to end wars abroad and reinvest the money that we had been wasting in those wars uh, into our workers, uh, helping to improve the lives of average, ordinary Americans. And he failed. He failed to do that. He got elected into office, and we all know what happened. Uh, giant bailouts for Wall Street. Uh, no, Virtually no help for Main Street. Average Americans were losing their homes in record numbers. They weren't getting bailed out. And so that message of hope and change was something that uh, was definitely used in campaigning, but Obama's first term didn't actually bear that out. And so that creates a situation of distrust, right? This environment of distrust toward politicians, political leaders, people who promise to improve the material conditions of Americans, but then fail to actually carry that out. So the real question is, why? If so much is on the line, especially in this election, what keeps Americans at home? What is their reasoning? And fortunately, uh, we did hear from some of the fine people over at West Virginia. Let's listen. I don't have TV. I don't have internet. Well, I have internet, so I have nothing to get on the internet with. You know what I mean? So I'm pretty far behind. <laughs> and I bet you a lot of us around here are because we're poor. I don't know nothing about the Joe. I, I ain't never heard nothing about him at all since I've been here. So, uh, Donald Trump, I know a little bit about him for the past couple of years. One, Trump is good. Two, Biden, however you pronounce his name, he's good too. But like I say, I can't judge either one of them. It's the same community, it ain't never gonna change. Because if it's gonna change, none of this would look like this right here. Here in Welch, Welch ain't changed in last three or four presidents. Nothing's changing. These are people who are living in poverty, uh, the first woman we heard from says that she has the internet, but she doesn't have a device to even utilize the internet on. And their economic situation has remained the same regardless of who's in office, regardless of whether it's George W. Bush, Barack Obama, Donald Trump. They haven't noticed any change in their material conditions. So if it seems like the election doesn't actually matter to your life, to your immediate conditions, why would you take the time 
or have the energy to go out of your way to cast a ballot for either member uh, that's running, whether it's Donald Trump or Joe Biden. That is the reasoning. And the first woman also noted that I haven't even I haven't heard from Joe Biden because he's not doing campaigning in McDowell, West Virginia. And I think that's relevant. It's relevant to pay attention to who gets neglected when it comes to campaign strategy. Now, poll after poll shows that Americans living in poverty are less likely to vote because they don't believe anything will fundamentally change. Well, to be fair, Biden did tell his Wall Street donors that under his presidency, nothing will fundamentally change. So that's an issue as well. And the New York Times did notice a similar trend. So for instance, they highlighted the story um, they highlighted the story of a Pennsylvania resident named Kiana Frederick, who didn't vote in 2016 and uh, is not convinced that she needs to vote in 2020 either. She was quoted as saying, politicians abandon voters like a bad mom or dad who promises to come and see you. And I'm sitting outside with my bags packed and they never show up. It's a pretty powerful statement. Um, and the imagery is important for political leaders of uh, these so-called elite to understand, to take note of, but they are invested in ignoring that kind of message. Um, and uh, class does have a lot to do with whether or not um, eligible voters are going to cast a ballot. For instance, in 2016, Americans who did not vote were more likely to be poor, less likely to have a college degree, and more likely to be a single parent than the people who did vote. Um, and then also in 2016, um, the analysis showed that three quarters of those living in households earning less than $150,000 voted compared with less than half of those in households earning less than $25,000. So it's amazing to me how, you know, you get those get out the vote campaigns. Like we've talked about it. Uh, Nando did a wonderful decode on it where, you know, you have these celebrities who are encouraging people to vote, like go out there and vote, go out there and vote. But these campaigns don't ever really focus on holding our politicians accountable to ensure that they have the right policies that appeal to people. So they actually do feel the need to get out and vote. In fact, like how could you not roll your eyes at those campaigns when they're talking about how Trump is an existential threat or you have to vote for Biden or you have to do this, you have to go out there, you got to do it. You, it's the most important election of the lifetime of your lifetime. When they literally hear that messaging every single election season and again, nothing changes and it doesn't even matter who ends up getting elected. Again, I'm talking specifically about material conditions and I think it's undeniable that nothing changes. Um, so the Financial Times also looked into something that I think was ignored by corporate media during the 2016 election, and that was the topic of NAFTA and the messaging that Donald Trump relied on to appeal to working class Americans. Let's take a quick look at that. Dollars, capital yes. can go wherever it wants. Jobs stay on the ground, yeah. and in particular, yeah. union jobs came under pressure with, deal, with deals like NAFTA, with the China, China coming into the WTO. That all happened in the last 20 years. I can imagine if I were a middle-class African-American voter working in Detroit, I would kind of be scratching my head. You know, the Clintons, are they really for mm. me? Are they protecting my yeah. jobs? And Hillary didn't have that kind of good old boy Southern feel that was very attractive to particularly in the South, right. amongst the African-American votes. She was like, from Chicago, uh, and, and there was just not that enthusiasm for her the way there was for Bill. Right. You know, it's it's interesting because I'm going back in my mind to 2016, and I'm, I'm seeing her in the first debate with Trump. And the minute he hit her on NAFTA, I thought, oh, gosh, she's toast. Uh. Because yeah. I thought this is the thing. Those jobs. Those yeah. jobs. Yeah. And it, it doesn't even matter. White, black workers, it doesn't matter. You can, it's very, very hard to change the fact that a bet was made that America was going to go up the sort of, you know, economic pyramid, that we were going to let those jobs go so that we could all be software developers and bankers. Yeah. Guess what? That yeah. didn't turn out so yes. well. <laughs> yes. No, it didn't turn out so well. And uh, NAFTA was successfully used by Trump uh, to encourage uh, people to vote for him. And by the way, again, going back to corporate media, every once in a while, they do an OK job putting out data, putting out articles uh, that show what the real sentiment is 
uh, you know, among working class voters. Uh, they expressed a profound distrust of politics and doubted their voice or their vote would have an effect, they write. They felt a sense of foreboding about the country and saw politics as one of the main forces doing the threatening. Many were not part particularly partisan and said they shrank from people who were. And so even uh, polling that was done by uh, 538 shows this, and this is uh, data about the 2020 election, which should have us concerned. So if you look at the numbers, people who are earning less than $40,000 are less likely to vote. They represent the largest voting block. Non-voters uh, are the largest voting block. Now, uh, if you go down uh, this list, you'll see that people earning um, $125,000 or more are much more likely to show up and cast a ballot. And so the current economic situation is something we should also consider. It is an absolute nightmare for the vast majority of Americans. Even the numbers that have been released by the Bureau of Labor Statistics does not fully capture the economic pain that the majority, literally the majority of Americans are feeling right now during this pandemic. So the official unemployment rate, for instance, is at 7.9%. But as we know, that number is incredibly misleading because it leaves out a number of people who uh, either are uh, underemployed, meaning they're looking for full-time work but can't find it, or uh, they're not earning a livable wage, or people who have just given up altogether in finding a job. When you consider all those statistics, uh, the numbers are actually pretty depressing, shocking, and are never fully addressed. Luckily, we have people like Richard Wolff who break it down for us. 46% of white Americans in America right now, over 16, are earning more than $20,000 a year, 46%. That means the majority of white Americans over 16, the majority, are not doing a full-time job earning $20,000 or more. And among uh, black Americans, it's 40.8%. So the majority of whites and blacks in our country that are over 16 don't have a full-time job earning $20,000 or more. So that means 54% of working age white Americans are not earning more than $20,000 a year. Just let that sink in for a second. I mean, I didn't even know it was that bad. I knew that the economic situation for the majority of Americans was pretty terrible. But these numbers are just absolutely devastating. And when you have one candidate say to, again, Wall Street donors, nothing will fundamentally change. And then you have an unhinged lunatic who pretends like he cares about the working conditions of Americans or the economic conditions of Americans. It really does put the Democratic Party at a disadvantage. And the fact that the Democratic Party refuses to acknowledge that is beyond frustrating. So rather than focusing incessantly on Bernie supporters who might not vote in this election or who might vote third party, honestly, a very negligible portion of the electorate, maybe the Democratic Party needs to take a good hard look at the very issues they have intentionally abandoned in order to appeal to their Wall Street donors or to Lincoln Project Never Republicans. I'm sorry, Never Trump Republicans. And um, it's also kind of interesting to uh, look at how the material conditions of people who are already wealthy have changed during this pandemic. Let's watch. From March to June 2020, Amazon founder Jeff Bezos saw his wealth rise by an estimated $48 billion. The founder of the video conferencing platform Zoom grew his nest egg by over $2.5 billion. And former Microsoft CEO Steve Ballmer's net worth increased by $15.7 billion. These kinds of examples might lead you to think that when billionaires profit during a crisis, it's just a matter of right place, right time. Well, that's not false, but it's not entirely true either. Casino magnate Sheldon Adelson saw his wealth increase by $5 billion while Elon Musk saw an increase of $17.2 billion. When you add up the numbers, billionaires in the United States... I mean, they've been raking it in during the pandemic, while simultaneously the federal government has failed to release another 
incredibly important and much needed stimulus package for working Americans. And so material conditions haven't changed. They've gotten much worse. The federal government has completely abandoned uh, average Americans. And so how are you going to persuade these people to show up to the polls? And I just haven't seen a concerted effort by the Biden campaign to do it. The effort so far has been, let's sit back and give Donald Trump enough rope to hang himself. And that has made my has made me uncomfortable. I know there are people who feel confident that he's going to win. And to be sure, I hope he does win. I want him to win because I do see Donald Trump as a threat. But at the same time, what's been frustrating is that all of this advice, all of this data, the, the, the facts on the ground, what's really happening in America has been ignored. And it is a risky strategy that's been uh, deployed by the Biden campaign. And let's also be fair about the Trump administration and what they're saying about the economic uh, situation during the pandemic, because they've also abandoned average working Americans. So for instance, um, the rise in COVID cases uh, raises the prospect of another wave of lockdowns, which is gonna be horrendous for people who are lucky enough to still have a job. Uh, it can cripple the economy. El Paso and Newark have introduced curfews to curb the surges in coronavirus cases in their jurisdictions. And so Trump has been awful in the response to coronavirus. That has hurt the economy even more for Americans. And then you look at some of the messaging coming from people who work for him, like uh, Joseph Lavorgna, who is the chief economist at the White House National Economic Council. He said that the underlying American economy remained fundamentally strong. And because for him, all that really matters is the stock market. He's not looking at the unemployment rate. He's not looking at what average wages are for people who are working. All he's looking at is, how's the stock market doing? And so when the stock market took a dip this week because of a lack of stimulus from the federal government, he blamed it on Europe saying, Europe is worse. And that spillover is happening. But the difference is in the United States is the data looks a lot better than it has in Europe. We're not going to lock down like they are in Europe, Europe is leading global stock markets lower. So he's essentially saying, no, no, we're gonna be fine. As long as we force people to work in dangerous conditions, as long as we force people to work during this pandemic, as long as we avoid another shutdown, we should be okay. And what he means is the stock market should rebound. He's not concerned about people dying. He's not concerned about people getting sick. He's not even considering the possibility of the federal government providing stimulus to keep people safe in their homes while also not threatening their material conditions. So both parties have been disastrous on this very issue. And it's not rocket science. It's very easy to have a message, have a platform that appeals to the vast majority of Americans and also appeals to this giant block of eligible non-voters. But they just won't do it because of a litany of reasons. Of course, neoliberal ideology is something that uh, has dominated both political parties in this country. Uh, but they're paid to essentially continue pushing for that type of ideology and avoid ever addressing the real bread and butter concerns of average Americans in the U.S. Yeah, no, and it's it's I mean, what I what I find pretty clear is that if we sit around and wait for the liberals and the Democratic Party to to do that, we're going to be waiting forever. They're just not going to do it. I mean, the only time we've ever had any sort of redistributive policies in this country was broadly speaking in like from the 1930s through the 1960s, like the New Deal era. And that was built by a very large labor movement with very large and powerful communist parties and socialist parties in the United States that were involved in the labor movement. Um, it was the left that organized workers. It wasn't the liberals. The liberals would never have done it. Um, and then they spent, obviously, the decade of the 1950s, I mean, and earlier as well, but purging the labor movement of uh, communists and you know, McCarthyism, you know, the, the seats of culture in Hollywood and things like that. So they were they really just destroyed the left first. Um, and then it, it just left that opening for 
for the situation that we have now, the sort of neoliberal reaction. Um, and until we rebuild that, um, it's always going to be that way. There's just, they're never going to do it ever, 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 ever. You know, they're just not going to do it. So we, th it's key for us on the left to, which we're starting to see the seeds of it. Like it's, we're nowhere near as powerful as it seems like in our own little cohort, obviously, but we're starting to see the seeds of something. Um, it's unclear to me how it's going to turn out or where it's going to go. I mean, it's like what Rick Wolf said, you just got to keep trying and keep going. There's never stop. You just got to hope that, you know, the work, uh, that work is successful, but like, you know, until we, we do that, that is the, that is our job. It's never going to be their job. They're never going to do it. You know, it's just literally our job to do it. So no, you're absolutely right. And I think, you know, assuming Biden wins, there will be a, a fantastic opportunity for the left to organize. And again, this is the this is the important part to provide an alternative solution to neoliberalism, right? To, to provide a solution that counters what Republicans are going to propose. Look, Republicans are going to propose bootstraps, uh, get it together. You guys are failures. You don't know what Deficit you're doing. Deficit reduction. Uh, you just, Deficit reduction. We just need more tax cuts. That's the real problem. Hopefully billionaires will trickle on you at some point. That's that's what their solution is going to be. And that is a failed policy. It's a failed message, which again opens up the opportunity for a well-organized left to provide a better alternative. I think the the real issue that we we need to focus on, to be honest with you, is how do we organize effectively and how do we not get distracted by divide and conquer tactics that will be deployed uh, by neoliberals? No, and, and those, I mean, videos of West Virginia are, those videos of West Virginia are, are heartbreaking because West Virginia was the, the sort of center of hotbed radicalism in the labor movement uh, for decades. And West Virginia was voted Democrat up until not that long ago. I mean, I mean Joe Manchin's still there. I mean, he's kind of like a, 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 a sort of... Uh, inertia from that time, you know, uh, but uh, West, West Virginia used to vote Democrat and, and used to be sort of a radical left like population. And it's just been completely destroyed. I mean, that legacy is just completely destroyed, ignored. Um, and and you get what what happens in the wake of that is what was what we saw there. Just people just completely off the, you know, out of the system, completely um, beaten down, alienated um, with no means to um, exercise power in any meaningful way. I mean, it's just it's 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 horrible. It's horrible. It is. You know, I didn't know this until recently, but um, do you know where the uh, term rednecks comes from? No, actually, I don't. It actually comes from West Virginia, but not for the reasons that, um, you know, you would think. It's because when workers would strike in West Virginia, they would wear um, red handkerchiefs like around their necks. And so they were referred to as rednecks. And I didn't know that. I, I learned about it, um, you know, through what was it, that candidate's name? There was a candidate who was running in West Virginia who was incredibly strong in oh, his Paula rhetoric. Oh, Paula Jean Swearingen? And... No, it wasn't Paula Jean. Um, I'm forgetting right now. Right. I'm, I apologize. I'll remember. But, um, you know, he said it during his campaigning and I was like, Ooh, oh, yeah, that's, Rick that's Ojeda, strong. Is yeah. his name? Yes, Rick yes, Ojeda? yes. Richard Ojeda? Yeah. yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. That was, yes. So I love, look, I disagree with him on a few issues, but um, his style of speaking appeals to me. I'll just leave it there.